I enter the path of male experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings Valero Texas Open. First look, research picks, preview, guess the odds. Coming at the end, you should know, this is the last event people have to qualify for the Masters if they're not previously qualified. We're going to have a ton of Masters content actually starting on Friday this week into the weekend, all next week, including Jeff Feinberg live in studio with me for the first time in like two years. We are very excited to do this, so uh, tune in to all of that, but tune into this show too and all the Valero stuff. This tournament tends to get overlooked because everyone's all hyped up and jazzed up to get in on the Masters, but there's money to be made. Uh, 30 to 1 at the Valero equals the same as a 30 to 1 at the Masters. So smash the like button to the episode, Sub to Mayo Media Network. The Listener's League is not yet available. I'm guessing the first chance that we're going to have to get into that is going to be on Monday with the Feinberg Show. Hopefully they send me the link as of then. But I want to remind you to get 20% off the Valero and the Masters if you get FantasyNational.com on Wednesday. Get the weekly FantasyNational.com slash Mayo. Get it on Wednesday. You get all the Valero. Make all your lineups. Do all your research. My walkthrough today is powered by FantasyNational.com. But then you get it for seven days, which means you get it through Wednesday next week, which means you get all your master's research, generate your line of study for the master's, and there's a lot of money up top. I think there's three millionaire makers already announced on DraftKings, plus everything that we got going on in the betting market. So fantasynational.com slash mayo to get in. Valero Texas Open. Uh, obviously, it's in Texas. TPC San Antonio is the course. There's 144 players in the field. And as I mentioned, anyone playing in this field who is not yet qualified for the Masters has one way to get in. You win, and you're in. We've seen it a bunch of times throughout the course of this tournament. We saw JJ Spawn do it a year ago. Spieth won the year before that, but he was obviously already in the Masters as a past champion. He's in the Masters forever until he wants to be. Corey Connors was not. He had to win as a qualifier to get into this tournament. We've seen Chuck Hoffman do it before in the past. I believe, I mean, no, Chuck Hoffman didn't because this got, this was later on in the year. I think this was in early May. I think the year that Connors won was the first year it was actually before the Masters. Houston used to be the week before the Masters. And just what we're seeing this week in terms of field is just a hodgepodge of guys that are like hurt, a few guys that need to play in, and then just a bunch of guys that you see at your non-elevated events on the PGA Tour still jockeying for their spot to get into the first major of the season. But I want to jump into the course, TPC San Antonio, the Oaks course. Don't get it confused with the Canyon course if you're going through everything and trying to do your research. There are three, or sorry, four par threes on the course, the average length over 200 yards, 200.5 yards. To be exact, hole 13 measures 241 yards, the fifth toughest on the course. And this really does boost up the average of the average yardage of the par threes. You take your medicine. These are the four most par holes on the course uh, all over two-thirds of the time. So you just make your pars, get out of dodge, try to score on the par fives and the easy par fours, and you're good to go. Shorter par fours, there's 10 of them on this course, and we're all over the place with 134 yards separating the shortest from the longest. The two shortest par fours carry a birdie rate north of 23%, one of which is hole 17, which also has a bogey rate of just 8.5%. All reward, little risk, unless you are holding a 250 to 1 Trey Mullinex ticket, and he tries to go for the green, leaves it left of the bunker on the short side, tries to chip it over that bunker, and skulls it directly into the bunker, thus costing you your chance to win a very, very very hefty payday, and Andrew Landry ends up getting a win. Yeah, that's a guy who's won twice on the PGA Tour. Andrew Landry. Fun times. That was 2018. It's funny how those like hor horrific beats at the end of tournaments really do stick out in your mind all these years later. That one shot, and you're just like, oh my god, I can't believe this happened. It's going to be like that. I mean, the Honda haunts me every single year, and it's the same shot that continuously kills me. Chris Kirk did it to Eric Cole. That little wedge from like 105 away sticks it to like a foot. Justin Thomas did the same thing to me when I had a Luke List ticket. The exact same shot on the exact same hole. Very last hole of the tournament. At least this one was a playoff. Jesus. Sticks out in your mind, is all I'm saying. Par fives, there's four of them. Average length is 587 yards. 
Three of the four surpass this average, with the shortest being hole number 14, 553 yards. Uh, it's the easiest hole on the course, the birdie rate of 42%, and that almost rivals the par rate of 47%. There were more eagles on hole 14 last year than the other three par fives combined, so that's where you need to score. Hole number eight is over 600 yards and could be a difference maker. It's a 20% birdie rate, but also a 16% bogey rate, and we all know about 18. There's that little creek in front of the hole, which is going to essentially turn it into a three-shot par five. Very few guys actually go for it and get it on that par five. So be very cognizant of that. For the course itself, uh, this is a Greg Norman design in consultation with Sergio Garcia, and it's been the host of this event since 2010. Uh, the Oaks course is the second toughest greens and regulation to hit, trailing only Riviera on the PGA Tour, and the front nine historically plays more difficult than the back. The field played the front nine at plus 3,704 compared to just plus 730 on the back in that same time from 2010 to 2020. And this event had more triple bogeys or worse, 290 in that time than all other courses except for TPC Sawgrass and PGA National. And that's really saying a lot because TPC San Antonio only has three water hazards on the course. The cut line has not been under par any year that it's been contested at TPC San Antonio. And we all, for all of us OGs in the DraftKings game, we will always remember the 2015 event. The cut line was plus seven, and it was sort of the beginning of people being very cognizant of what the weather is going to be. There was a wave that was completely wiped out. I think just, I think it was something around like 10% of the guys who played in that wave ended up making the cut. There was such a distinction between the morning Thursday round and the afternoon Thursday round. I think it was winds of like 40 miles per hour in the morning and five in the afternoon. Dustin Johnson and Carlos Ortiz actually rallied quite nicely and finished top 10 in that tournament despite being in the bad wave. So the gusts, uh, were the most impactful, like I mentioned, that year. The morning wave had a scoring average of 78.6, four strokes worse than the afternoon wave. It still played at, like, plus three, uh, but it's you know, much easier than plus six, and it caused seven players to withdraw over the first two rounds because they knew they had no chance. Uh, and outside of an insane British Open, it's doubtful we'll ever see the wind impact anything that much again, so don't think that's going to happen. But when you hear us talk about the weather and the weather splits and how things can be geared to your advantage, it's usually just this one event that we go back to year over year uh, that sticks fresh in our mind when we think about everything. Let's head over to fantasynational.com and just take a look at the course breakdown just a little bit so you can visualize some of this. As mentioned, the uh, the Greens regulation are very tough to hit. Riviera, Harbor Town, and Southwind are some of the other ones that you can look at over this time. You see 591, that par 5 at the end. Very few eagles, 0.7% eagle rate, where you have the 2.2% rate on number 14. Five of the, pa five of the past seven champions now with J.J. Spawn winning a year ago. I don't think that he had actually been up there before. Let's see, J.J. Spawn, he did have a top 30 in the event. Does that actually finish? Let's see. Five of the past six champions had a top 30 finish in the year before. So it's now five of the past seven champions had a top 30 finish the year before. Every winner except for now Spawn and Steven Bowditch had made the cut the year before. I guess Spawn did make the cut. He finished like 60-something the year before he ended up winning. Uh, in oh, Sorry, had made the cut in the event in his start directly prior to winning. That's all jumbled now because it's on a different part of the calendar. And four of the past, sorry, five of the past eight winners made the Valero Texas Open their first PGA Tour win. You have Spawn, Connors, Landry, Chapel, and Steven Bowditch. And since play began at the Oaks course in 2010, the third round leader has gone on to win eight times in the past 12 years. So live betting opportunities, it's going to be pretty tough to come back. As we kind of scroll down from the scorecard a little bit, when you take a look at the top five finishers, one thing that I did notice, pretty even tee to green, not as pronounced. Like some courses we see approach factor in like three times as much as driving in around the green. It's less than half this time around. So a pure balance of tee to green. And we've seen driving distance play a big factor here, but we've also seen some of the shorter hitters with great accuracy uh, end up doing it well too. If you're going to go with one of the short hitters, you do want to look at driving accuracy along with strokes gained off the tee over that time. It's one thing just to be good at hitting fairways. It's another thing to actually be gaining strokes when you're hitting the fairway because you're still putting it out there like 290, 295, whatever it might be, rather 
than like 260. Like the Brian Stewards of the world is always the example that I like to use. Wesley Bryan, back in the day, not so much anymore because he doesn't hit any fairways anymore, or plays on the PGA Tour anymore. So, I mean, periodically, I suppose he pops up. I wonder if we'll see him at Heritage as a former winner this year, uh, although it's an elevated event. Uh, par fives, where you need to do your damage. As I mentioned, tread water on the par threes. And with the par fours, like you, there are a couple of them. I mentioned 17. It's the second easiest hole on the course. Number five, the fourth easiest hole on the course, all north of 20%. I didn't really look to see if there's any sort of significant advantage of starting on... Yeah, hole number one is the third hardest hole on the course. So the wraparound would actually come 16, 17, and 18, more than likely if that was going to happen for a birdie streak in showdown. And number nine and number six are the second, sorry, nine and 10 are the second and sixth most difficult holes on the course. 9% birdie rate, 11% birdie rate. So it's unlikely that there's any sort of advantage starting on the front versus starting on the back for showdown purposes. Just roll with what you gots this week. Average shot distribution is pretty flat. Uh, one of the flattest you're going to see all year on the PGA Tour. A lot from inside 150 yards. So from this bucket, 15% of shots, 13% of shots, 6% of shots. It's a pretty high margin for inside 150 yards. Uh, usually you see this big spike in terms of the 200 plus because of the par fives, but because Two of these are layup par fives. You don't, you I mean, you're going to get approach shots from there, but there's a lot of layups that go into it. So a lot more shots coming from this bucket. Uh, very short wedges. Can you be dialed in with your short wedges? Well, you have a chance to do it. As I mentioned, the cut line hasn't been below par ever at this course. Last year, it was even. And that year in 2015 was plus seven, but nothing below par. We'll see if that changes this year in a field of 144. Driving accuracy much lower uh, than your average PGA Tour event. As mentioned, the green and regulation percentage much, much lower than your average PGA Tour event. Don't be Kevin Na and take a 16 and have to come back the next year with a chainsaw in the woods, by the way. Although the driving distance, uh, the driving distance is much higher, 285 to 283, not much higher, but you know, proportionally higher by a few yards. You can be a bomber here and where so few people are actually, not so few people, but where players are hitting the fairway less than your average PGA Tour event, extra distance can get you into the right angle. And if it's going to be a lot of wedge shots anyway, it might not hurt you as much. Uh, sort of the Bryson strategy, less of an extreme than we saw at Wingfoot because no one was hitting the fairway at Wingfoot. But just be as close to the hole as possible and try to figure it out from there. The average green and, rocks, green and regulation proximity, a bit longer than your average PGA Tour event. So not all that critical considering fewer people hit the fairway that it's going to be 30.4 to 29 feet it doesn't seem like the rough is hurting you all that much on your green regulation approach shots. So when we take a look back at the history at this course, to give you a quick reminder of what has happened at the Valero Texas Open over the years, I mentioned J.J. Spawn got himself into the Masters a year ago uh, following two missed cuts at this tournament. I was not on that, but I know a lot of people were on J.J. Spawn. Uh, he was too clear of Matt Jones and Matt Kuchar. In this event a year ago, he opened with a 67. That was his best round. And the only golfer not to shoot worse than 70 all week. Just very consistent across the board. The top seven finishers all gained strokes on the field from the sand on this course. So in terms of sand saves gained, they all gained on the field in that number. 2021, uh, I remember this very vividly because I had a big Cam Tringali bet and he wilted down the stretch. We also had Matt Wallace that year who came third. Playing a lot better golf recently, by the way, Matt Wallace, as we've seen the past two tournaments. He's making a run in Putacana right now. I don't know what the result of that tournament is, but I really hope it's party, Marty, trainer, because that would be, that would get me out of the hole for the year. Tell you that much right now at 275 to 1. Even a top five, we'd still be looking pretty good. Uh, hopefully we can find a hot putter come Sunday. Spieth shot 67 or better three of the four rounds. So when it came to beating Hoffman, Spieth was eight strokes better on Thursday. That was the big difference between him and Hoffman. I mean, this all the Texas swing used to be like the Charlie Hoffman Open. I don't even know how Charlie Hoffman's been playing recently, to tell you the God's honest truth. I know he had a few turns where the ball striking was good. Yeah, you know, it was earlier in the year. He's missed three cuts in a row. The putting has been egregious. But how has he been at Valero? I mean, he generally gains on the greens in Valero. He generally gains on the greens in Texas. This used to be his jam. Yes, he missed it last year, but seconds, the two times before that, a win, 11th, 11th, 3rd, 13th, 2nd, 13th. He's not the player he used to be, obviously, 13 years ago, but he's you know, not that far off the player he was two years ago at the same time. And he still is piling up a bunch of good numbers with approach. Can he turn around the off the tee? And the putting... 
feasibly should flip in his favor at a course where he's just very familiar with these greens. Obviously, that's not a guarantee, but something to look at a little bit. 14 of the top 16 finishers last year gained in proximity from 175 to 200. Iron play all around. Nine of the top 11 finishers gained in both the 75 to 100 and 100 to 125 yard buckets. That's how you're going to score on the difficult par fives and not end up making a big number on the difficult par fives at the same time because it's a big pendulum when you look at it. Either you're going to stick it close and you're going to make your birdies or you're going to miss and be in that little creek and have to take a drop and start making bogeys on holes you should be at least parring and other guys are making birdie on. So keep that in mind. Corcon, get some CanCon in here. Corey Connors played amazing the year that he won. He started off hot. He had consecutive 66s over the weekend. He was the only player in the field with four rounds in the 60s. Seven of the top 13 finishers lost strokes around the green, but all 13 of them gained strokes off the tee. As I said, driving more important at this course than most of them. You see, see, woo! Kim Streelman's had some great run here. Cooch, obviously. Ben Ann is someone I probably would look at, although he has a chance... Ben Ann has a pretty good habit of fizzling out on like Saturday and Sunday and after being there, like in the in contention. Because I, I think almost every time that we've played Ben Ann in DraftKings this year or had a bet on him as a top 20 or whatever, it always seems like it's going to win. But you look at his results. He hasn't missed a cut yet this year, but 45th. Like he was like two shots, two shots off the lead at one point at the Valsberg. Finished 45th. 35th of the players. He was up there for a while. 21st of the Honda. He was up there for a while. Uh, but... And he continues to make cuts. It's weird that for a guy that used to be so good off the tee that he really struggles, and now all of a sudden he can putt, which is just mind-bending, considering in his career he's losing almost two strokes on the greens per start, and now he's gaining like 1.3 over his past four. I don't know if that's going to stick or not, but I would like him to start driving the ball a little bit better because the irons have been really good. He's one of the better players in the world around the green. Now that he has a bit of a putter, if he can keep that going, if he could just find something off the tee... It could be a, a Ben Ann breakthrough. And he doesn't have that first career PGA win. Hasn't happened for him yet. I believe Davis Riley won at the Canyons course when he played on the Corn Ferry Tour here. Just keep that in mind. I think he's a tech. I think Davis Riley's a Texas guy. But you know, this is the research show. So I, you know what? I can research that for you. Davis Riley. Let's see here. Davis Riley is. No, he's from Mississippi. Okay. Let's, uh, let's click on his old wiki here. Wiki, wiki. I don't know why he wants me to drag and drop. Stuff here. Let's see. Where does he have his wins on the Corn Ferry Tour? Uh, Panama TC, TPC San Antonio Championship. I, I do believe that was at the Canyons course. And it played... No, it was at TPC San Antonio. So he has won at this course in 2020, just coming out of the pandemic. And that was over Pendrith. And Long Dong Paul Barjon that year. So, yeah. If you want to go research the Corn Ferry Tour, I suppose we could do that, couldn't we? We could go... Let's see here. Davis Riley... Official World Golf Ranking. I mean, I could probably just bring it up on Davis Riley, couldn't I? Now that I think about it, he's been playing a lot better. He didn't have a really good run at the match play, but the fact that he was in the match play is really saying something. He didn't have to go play Putacana. Go look at his wins. San Antonio Championship, because we have all the Corn Ferry data in here. Yeah, it was the, it was the Oaks course. Riley, Pendrith, Baljean. Wee Kim! Will Zalatoris. And he won at minus 16, by the way. Two shots over Pendrith and Baljean. Ben Martin is there. Who else would be in this field? Lee Hodges. Nick Hardy made the cut. Fake Denny McCarthy. Dan McCarthy. Andrew Novak. Jared Wolf. I don't know what happened to Jared Wolf. He was like kicking around for a while. Dylon Wu made the cut. Eric Cole made the cut. Wesley Bryan, speaking of him earlier. Harrison Endicott has been just kind of lurking around. Vince India. That was a great name. Uh, Carl Wan is up there as well. But at the top of the board, the guys who are in this field, Riley and Pendrith and the Smother Man came in fourth as well. It would probably be the ones that you'd want to look at if you want to play like Corn Fairy history. At least good vibes for Riley from around this course. How did he do here a year ago? I assume he played, and I assume this was like a narrative last year. I wonder if it actually worked out for him. Valero. It was 63rd at Valero. Lost six strokes putting a year ago. It was actually quite good. T to green, so I guess maybe something to keep in mind. Clearly, he putted well the year that he won at this course. Did not work out all that well for him a year ago uh, when we were looking at this. 2018, Andrew Landry was the winner, I mentioned, over Trey Mullenix and Sean O'Hare, Jimmy Walker, Ryan Moore. Ryan Moore's had some pretty good run at this event, too. 18th, 7th, 3rd, 76th uh, in four of the past five years. Didn't play it a year ago, and just he 
I don't know. He's got really, he had the seventh of Pebble Beach. That's really all he's got at this point. He's another guy who can't drive it anymore. The putting can be good, but he can't chip worth a damn. So if he's not driving it well, the irons are okay enough, but probably not where I would be looking as like a course history guy this week. He might be a bit past his prime at this point. The only player to shoot all rounds in the 60s was Andrew Landry. All top six finishers shot 68 or better Saturday, including the 62 from Mullinix, which just would have been glorious. Kevin Chappell won in 2017. One, uh, we had been betting Chappell so often in 2017, and when it got to this tournament, I think he was the third favorite. This happened to Russell Henley at in Houston one year, too where they were like 20 to 1 after us betting them at like 80 to 1 in every tournament all year long, or even in triple digits. And the number was cut so much, everyone was like, oh, fuck this. We're not betting Kevin Chappell. And then all of a sudden, he just ends up winning. And it was horrible because we all saw it coming, but no one wanted to eat that price in this tournament. He avoided the bad round. 71 was his worst. He beat Brooks by one that year. Kevin Tway was T3. Kevin Tway WD'd from this last year, as did Hideki. Hideki just WD'd from the match play as well, but he is in the field this week in case you were wondering. What a seven of the top nine uh, in terms of greens and regulation gained. All cash top 10 paydays. Chapel and Kepka were two of the three best in the week in greens and regulation. So just something to think about as we go through it. The field this week is, like I said, kind of a mismatch of you know, guys that are kind of good. You know, we, we do have Kazuki Higa in the field. He will be playing in the Masters next week. He won the Dunlop Phoenix at the end of the year in Japan a year ago. Uh, additionally, he hasn't played in a while. He hasn't played since the Hero Indian Open where he came fourth. He played in Thailand. These are DP World Tour slash Asian events. So he was fourth. He was T11, T13. That one was in Oman when all of the live guys ended up playing. I believe that was the one where all the live guys ended up playing. That was an Asian tour event. Let me just do a little bit of digging on Higa for a second as I pull that up. I believe... No, that is not the right... You yeah, know, that is the one. That's where... Takumi Kanaya ended up winning. Neiman was in fifth. Sergio was in fifth. Uh, Matt Jones. So, yeah, this one's where a, a few of the live guys ended up playing. Yeah, Higa was 13th. He tied with Kokrak and Tani Hara and Scott Vincent. So not all of the live guys played, but enough of them played to, like, really boost up the quality of that field. He ended up T13 there. He's not a bad player. Uh, the last time he missed a cut was the Panasonic Open Golf Championship on the Japanese Tour last summer. Uh, he only has one win, but he has a runner-up. Uh, I mean, he won the biggest event to get himself basically into the Masters, which was huge. Uh, he played in the Sony earlier this year as well and came T-72, so not a great run from him. We haven't really seen him outside of the Sony. He missed the cut at the Open Championship last year. 36 at the Zozo. Not really much ado. Probably doesn't need to be on your radar, but if he is one of these guys that ends up coming in at, let's say, like 6,600 on DraftKings, he is the 81st best player in the world. That's skewed because he has wins on other tours, but... I don't really know where his level is in terms of real talent, but we've seen guys like this prosper before. Like, Higo comes over after dummying crap fields on the DP World Tour, and, you know, he ends up winning at the Palmetto. Uh, we saw that with my guy, Satashi Kadaira. Uh, he got himself into the Masters. He missed the cut. He was, had been playing great in Japan, got himself up inside the top 50 in the world, and boom, he just spikes at Heritage the very next week. So I, I would never want to overlook these types of players when it comes down to it. Overall, I have it set to top 50 rounds. So the leaders in strokes gained total over the last 50 rounds in this field, Taylor Montgomery, Hatton, Dietrich, Ben Griffin, and Ricky Fowler. Fowler needs to win to get in as he is not in the Masters field as of yet. Maybe it's a great narrative to bet Ricky. Just, you want Ricky to be in the Masters, bet him to win this week. That's the only way he can get in. Mitchell, Putnam, Nick Taylor, Sam, Ryder, hardly knew her, and Brennan Todd, the Todd father, all inside the top 10. The rest of the players in this field, Hideki, again, coming off the WD, saying he's going to play. No one is going to bet him or play him this week, so he'll probably end up winning when it comes down to it because no one wants a part of that smoke with Hideki coming off a WD at a tournament with the same injury where he WD'd last year, just for what it's worth. Corey Connors, Siwoo Kim, Taylor Montgomery, as mentioned, Keith Mitchell, Chris Kirk, Ricky Fowler, Davis Riley, Matt Kuchar, Davis Thompson, who had a really good match play until the very final day. I mean, he was six under in his matchup against Cameron Young and lost by four holes, which is outrageous to think about. I don't think he got to the end of the round. I think he only played 16 holes, but he played much better than the score would have indicated for him. Ryan Fox is playing. Seb Straka, Alex Noren, J.J. Spawn, Thomas Dietry, Higo, Pendrith, Ben Ann are all in the field this week, uh, as are like your regulars, your Badleys, your, your Hayden Buck, who loves to fuck Lee. Will Gordon is playing. Alex Smalley 
Uh, Cameron Davis is playing, uh, who I bet you it rates out amazingly if we go back too far. So let's not go back too far and take a look at the modeling for this week and see if we can find some uh, hidden gems for ourselves. So we got past 24 rounds. Let's load up the model right now. I, I have a feeling this one, let's see here, Valero, pretty solid. Okay, well, that's great news. So I've waited, approach at 15 and off the tee at 10%. So not a huge gap like it normally is. Then I combine the two and put in 30% for ball striking. <laughs> Just overload on all that. Driving distance at 10%, par fives at 5%, opportunities gained at 10%. Now I do have other things in here just so I can make note of them when I take a look at them. So I have like this rated at 0%, but I do want to like in the back of my mind when I compare it to the other proximity ranges, as I mentioned before, like the 175 to 200 has been very valuable in scoring at this course, but I do have... I have that weighted at 0% as a comparison tool because I have around the green at 5, 125 to 150 at 5, 100 to 125 at 5, uh, and the long par 3 is at 5% as well. I have putting rated at 0, which I am going to take out because I'm going to drop ball striking to 25% and increase putting to 5% because I do want to weight putting in this. In fact, I'm going to put in two of the key ranges that I always like to put in, but I'm going to make it 10 to 15 feet this week uh, as the key one where you're probably going to make the majority of your birdies if you're not sticking it that that close and that one as we've seen over time has been a little bit more repeatable uh, than anything beyond 15 feet there are historically good putters especially in good form from 10 to 15 feet so let's take a look at what the results tell us for the Valero in Texas this week. Again, fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself 20% off all of the memberships. But if you get the weekly and you want to test it out and you want this for the Masters to generate your lineups, get it on Wednesday, go Wednesday to Wednesday, and boom, you get two tournaments for the prices of price. The price is right. The price is right, but it's for the price of one. Let's see here. Tyrrell Etten, number one. Coming. He hurt his hand at match play, and like he, frankly, he played terrible at match play. Uh, I don't know if it was the hand that really did affect him all that much, but... You know, something to keep an eye on. Hatton, Fowler, Keith Mitchell, Davis, Riley, C. Woo! Kim are your top five coming into the week over the past 24 rounds. List, Connors, Higo, my guy, definitely betting Higo. Kadira, my other guy, Kadira. How the hell is he? The last time Kadira played. And Chris Kirk. Chris Kirk has had a very good run at this tournament over the years. Um, you know, he finally broke through at the Honda where he had had some great run over the years. Let's see, is this Kadira? Kadira played the Honda, missed the cut. I don't know. I mean, his ball striking has been fantastic. Dude can't putt to save his life. How does he play it here? Valero missed the cut last year. Okay. Chris Kirk, when we take a look at his Valero stats, he's kind of, he hit his peak when he won, and now he's been kind of on the downswing a little bit. But <clears throat> 35th, 6th, missed cut, 8th, missed cut, 13th, 8th, and 48th in his career. Last year was bad putting. But great tee to green, 6.7 strokes tee to green. When he came eighth, he had a bad putting week. He's been very good around the greens here. He gained 11.1 strokes in 2018 uh, tee to green as well. 3.5 when he came sixth in 2021. That was with six strokes gained putting. So you can see he kind of flamed out of match play. He made one of the worst shots I've seen all week there, by the way. Uh, the around the green has been good. The driving has been okay. Played okay at the Arnold Palmer. The putting has cooled off a little bit. When the putting cools off, for Chris Kirk, it doesn't tend to go very well, but he does have a lot of experience at this course. Alex Molly, Cam Davis, Bram Wagon, Jagabombs, James Hahn, Dylan, woo! Nick Hardy is another guy who made the cut that year in the Corn Ferry Tour. Percy, there's Ryan Fox, there's Aaron Rye. Aaron Rye is, you know, case of the, the old ups and downs with Aaron Rye. He's been playing some pretty decent golf. We were all on him at the Honda. Dude couldn't putt to save his life. And he, at least he got himself out of the hole in putting. Well, he's had some bad run on the greens. Not historically a very good putter. Was 29th here last year. Lost off the tee, although he's someone who hits a ton of fairways, generally gains off the tee, but did gain on the greens. We've seen the approach play been a lot better, uh, although... It's skewed at the players. He had a hole-in-one and still gained fewer than three strokes on approach. And I guarantee you that one was worth, like, two. So he would have gained, but not by all that much. Let's say he had put that ball one inch from the cup instead of in. That 2.9 probably goes to, like, 1.7 pretty quickly. Still good. And I do like that he pulled himself out of the hole on the on from putting. It's actually been pretty good outside of the Honda, where he still did gain tee to green. Just had a pretty off week for him. 7.3 tee to green, 5.2, 6.2 tee to green, three of his past four starts. It's not bad. Played well in Houston, so another Texas course during the swing season, came seventh. Putted well on those Bermuda greens. Okay. I can get behind Aaron Rye, I suppose. Uh, the putting is really what's going to drag him down. Who is the best? I mean, we, I want to look a bit longer term. 
for some of these key wedge range. Russell Knox is like by far the best, as it turns out, in both of them when you compare them side by side. I'm looking, I'm sorting by the best from 100 to 125. Next to it on my cheat sheet, I have 125 to 500 or to 150. I have them both weighted at 5%, but just like you see some guys, Stuart Sink, fourth in the one bucket. 13th in the other bucket. This should be one I'm looking at it past 24 rounds. This is probably a better one to look at either very short, like 8 or 12 or 100 rounds and try to juxtapose those. We could do that. I mean, we can do that in a little bit if we want to, but only if we want to, right? Who else is good at this? Molinari is good from this range. Davis Riley, very good from this range. 10th and 20th in terms of ranking. Molinari was 7th and 30th. Who's this here? David Lingmer, take me to your leader. 13th and 19th. Eric Cole. Cole's hole. 16th and 26th. Kadira, 19th. That's why he's ranked so high. 19th and 15th. Luke Donald, pretty good there. You never want to play. You never go full Donald. It's never good. Duffner's good from here. Hatton's good in both. So Hatton's probably deservingly, probably won't be the betting favorite. Could be the betting favorite. He's going to be either first or second on the list, but probably a pretty decent look if the hand is okay. Bob Shelton, uh, pretty good at both. Higo is good from that one range, but not good from the other one. Chris Kirk is the best from 125 to 150, but 48th. Lee Biota is also quite good. Crazy Carl, Crazy Carl Juan, uh, top 55 in both in this field. Guys that didn't pop up from the other end, like uh, good at 125 to 150, but bad the other way. Norin, Taylor Montgomery, Flea Market. Who else do we got here? J.B. Holmes. Good Lord, J.B. Holmes. Corey Connors is another one who's top 40 in both. Aaron Rye is top 20 in 125 to 150, but 100th from 120 to 125. And listen, you can adjust the ranges, see how people do on this long term in that one stat if you wanted to. If you want to use the rolling report on Fantasy National just by going down here and picking your stat on the left side of the screen, then you can kind of get a judge of how people are, or you can put them both in the mixed condition model and weight them. So if you wanted to weight the past 10 rounds versus the past 100 rounds, which we can do pretty easily. Let's let's give that a shot right now just to test out to see how that goes. We're going to go to proximity and we're going to go to past 12 rounds and we're going to throw four separate things into the mixed condition model. First of all, we are going to add 100 to 125 and we're going to say last 12, 100, we'll call it. 100 prox and we'll add that in. And then we will go to past 100 or 75 rounds, let's call it, and look at the same stat and add that to the mixed condition model. So we'll add that again. We'll go to the 100 to 125 and call this last 75, 100 prox. We'll load that in. And now we'll load in the other side of that and do it backwards this time, 125 to 100. Last 75, 125 procs, and we'll add that in, and then we'll go back to the past 12 rounds and add in the same stat so we can get a good look at someone who is consistent from that range over time, or someone who was good, has been faltering, or has been trending upwards or trending downwards. That's the way that we can kind of look at some of these things, and one of the comparisons that I like to do when I'm just messing around, one of the fun things about Fantasy National is doing things like this. The past 12, 125 procs didn't mean to hit enter on that. I don't know if that got added in or not. Let's take a look. Uh, nope, it did not. So let's go back and we'll try that out again. Uh, past 12 rounds instead of past 50 rounds. And we'll add in 125 to 150. And you can do this with any stat, by the way. This is just one that I wanted to look at for the moment. Last 12, 125 proximity. Add that in. Then we go click on mixed condition model. You see everything is weighted at you, know, you have four. It's everything's weighted at 25%. That's good with me. Let's load that in and take a look at, you can rank them like you do in your regular model. You can even throw your model rank into a mixed condition model if you wanted to and make it one of the categories and weight it against other course specific things, whether you wanted hard to hit greens and regulation or windy conditions, whatever it might be. You can all load it into this if you want to mess around with it. Chris Kirk, Knox, Riley, Lee Biota, Cam Davis, Chuck Hoffman, Ryan Fox, Will Gordon, Lingmurth, Stewart, out of all people, Luke Donald, Kadira, Ben Griffin, Matt Wallace. Wallace is going to be a popular bet this week. Duffner, Eric Cole, Hideki, Connors, Siwu, Tyrrell Hatton, and Ricky Fowler are your top 20 if you weight all of those over those different lengths of time at 25% apiece. But let's just take a look at it. Guys that have gotten better. Kyle Westmoreland. Oh, my daddy's a general and I'm the best in the field from 100 to 125 over the past 12 rounds. 26. I don't know how many rounds that actually 
Oh, you actually, if you dump it over, it's 3.4 per round. Okay, that's not bad. And 12.6 per round gained on the field. When you look at it over the past 12, you just kind of hover over each of those numbers. Not great from the next two ranges. Chris Kirk is just amazing from all of them. Russell Knox long-term is great, although he's been slipping 125 to 150. As you can see, Bezadenhout in the short term is fantastic from this range. It was not good at the uh, match play, by the way, but you know, keep that in mind. Kevin Roy is a big riser from 75 to the past 12 rounds, 94th to 11th. Ben Ann goes from 80th to 13th. Harry Eggs, 116th to 14th is another one. 140th to 26th is beautiful Bo Hosser, who does have a top five finish at this event. Oct oh, Akshay's in this field? Pfft, in 133rd to 30th, and we'll see if he can... I don't know how he finished up on Saturday. He was like even through 13 or something stupid like that. Pissing me off. After he went like 9... He shot like 29 on the front on Friday. I thought he was going to make a run. Love Batia. My guy. Ro Patrick Rogers, 123rd to 36th. So these are the guys that have improved over that time. If we kind of reverse engineer it, guys, I've gotten worse... Uh, over the time. And again, 12 rounds is a very small sample. That's why you kind of want to look at both of them and see who has been consistently good in these numbers. Like Todd has gotten worse, although he finished inside the top five last year. Cameron Davis went from top 10 to top 50. Like He's still in the top half of the field. He's just not in the top 10 of the field anymore. Ryan Fox has gotten a little bit worse. Kadira has gotten a little bit worse. Who else here? Bramlett. Andrew Landry, Ben Martin, I've all gotten a little bit worse in that time. So now if we take a look at 125 to uh, 150, we're on this is, again, when I loaded this in, this is the 75 rounds. To the right here is the 12 rounds when you're looking at it. Uh, who else has gotten a lot, uh, a lot worse over time? Fowler's gotten a lot worse in this number over the past 12, as is Max McGreevy, Mark Hubba Hubbard, Austin Eckroat, Justin Lower, Ryan Almael, and Dylan Fratelli. Fratelli finished top 10 at this tournament a year ago. But in the short term, when we look at it, you can see that Chris Kirk has just been good. Chuck Hoffman has actually been good in both of these. I mean, Chuck Hoffman rates out sixth in this number. So Aaron Rye, MJ Duffy, Cam Davis. All right, so Cam Davis short-term from this range, very good. Cameron Davis long-term from the other key range, very good. Stupid Cameron Davis is going to take all my fucking money again this week. I fucking know it. Ugh! <sighs> Star next to his name. Ugh. Sean O'Hare? Oh, that's not good. Kramer Hickok, trending upwards. Been very good from this range. Ryan Palmer, who long-term had a lot of success at this course in the past. Piercy... Better short-term than long-term. J.B. Holmes, better short-term than long-term. Keith Mitchell, better short-term than long-term. I mean, I'm talking about a significant gap here, not like, oh, he was eighth and now he's fifth. No, it's like 77th to 25th. Bryce Garnett is one of those guys. Brandon, woo! Adam Shank, another one who rates out well in that regard. So that's just one way that we can look at it uh, when we break through everything. I guess it's time to now guess the odds for Z Valero, Texas Open. I want to make this quick and painless, so I did them beforehand. I do have Hideki as the betting favorite. That's probably, I mean, he, I would, I don't want to bet on that he's not going to play, but I don't think that he is going to play in this tournament. If he pulled out of the match play, although he was already eliminated, so I guess it didn't really matter to him. Will Zalatoris, by the way, also withdrew from the match play, so he's not in this tournament, but keep an eye on that for the Masters. That's going to kill his Masters DraftKings ownership, and especially if Hideki doesn't play this week, too. I mean, guys that have both won and come second in the past two years. So keep that in mind when looking at it. Um, but we have, I have Hideki at 16 if he plays, Hatton at 18, Connors at 18, Siwoo at 22. I have those as the four favorites. And with this field, with the weird names in here, these could be not way off in terms of what these odds are going to be. But if I have Siwoo as the fourth favorite, if he opened as the favorite, I wouldn't be super stuck. Actually, I would be if Hatton's there. But, you know, he has the hand injury. Hideki has the neck injury. Would Siwoo be over Connors? Maybe Connors hasn't really played all that well. So if Siwoo was the favorite, wouldn't surprise me. If Siwoo was 13th on the list, I probably wouldn't be super surprised either based on some of these names. They're all kind of in that same range of players. So Siwoo at 22. I have Montgomery and Ricky Fowler at 25. Keith Mitchell at 28. Chris Kirk and Ryan Fox both at 33. J.J. Spawn, the defending champion, at 35, was amazing through three rounds of match play, and then, then he got bounced. Kucher, Davis Riley, and Thomas Dietrich at 40 to 1. Norin at 50 to 1. Ben Ann at 55 to 1. Pendrith at 60 to 1. 
Davis Thompson at 66 to 1 would be my take on how these odds are going to shake out. If you have a strong lean on anyone this week, I would think the move would be bet it as early as often and shop around. Now, I always recommend that people use DraftKingsSportsBook.com. That's a given. That's where you should be betting. Probably not a bad idea to shop around this week on the opening odds because guys like, for example, someone like Siwoo. Siwoo might open at 16 to 1 in one place. He might open at 33 in a different place. Now, they're eventually, by Monday night or Tuesday morning, all meet at relatively the same number depending on where the money comes in. But the openers at a tournament like this on some of the players are going to be all over the place. Someone like Batia, for example, may open at 50 on one book. He might open at 125 on another book. Maybe that's pushing it in terms of like what he's going to be. But it could be as low as 40. It could be as high as 100, something like that. Then it will meet somewhere in the middle of those numbers once everything balances out. But when you get a tournament like this with no defined clear favor, because both the guys who should be the clear favorites are both injured at the moment, and this whole mid-tier of guys who could really break out, you're just scattershotting across the board. Like Ricky, you know, might be 20 to 1 at some places, might 30 to 30 to 1 at some places, depending on where they want to open it. So pay very close attention to the openers on Monday morning. And because this is the Valero Texas Open, and I wouldn't expect a ton of handle, especially with the Masters in two weeks and with the match play beforehand, there's just so little interest in a tournament like this that if you miss out on a number and everyone starts betting the same, like Cam Davis, for example, uh, he could be 35 to one very easily. Do I have him? I didn't even have him on this list of guys that I put through. He could open at 35. He could open at 75. If he opens at 75, everyone is going to bet him at 75, no matter where it is. And that 75 will become 40 very quickly. We've seen this happen way too many times. If you want that good number on the guy that you like, shop around at the opener and hammer it immediately because it's going to be gone. There's no waiting on numbers in a tournament like this with a field like this. Okay? FantasyNational.com slash Mayo will get you 20% off. Again, if you get off any membership, so if you get the monthly, it takes you to the end of April, basically, at this point. But if you get the weekly, on Wednesday, you get Wednesday to Wednesday, which means you get Valero, all the showdown, live stuff during the tournament, plus all the masters, especially when the salaries are released. The mail all be loaded up immediately. You can get your research going right away. I'll be back with Feinberg on Monday in the comments section. I want to hear your early winner. Smash the like, sub to the channel, and download the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Apple Podcast or Spotify while you're at it to help me out. We'll be doing giveaways next week for review, as we always do during Major Week. All right, I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!